to record. Okay, we're being recorded. <laughs> Okay, so Diane, I think we can start with your crew whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. I mean, it's really their show. I've enjoyed working with them tremendously, but they have entirely put this together on their own um, with help from our wonderful teacher, Will Mason, who's been a great partner. And I just think it's been um, a super successful experience. So I'm going to see this for the first time myself, and I'm really looking forward to it. So you guys should take it away whenever you're ready. Um, do you guys want me to put up the slideshow and then you can just tell me when to, uh, okay. Um, okay. Oh, uh, oh, all right. Do I need to give you permission or is it? No, I was going to ask, but I just figured it out. Yeah. Okay. Can you guys see it? Okay. Um, who wants to start <laughs> out of the uh, Dr. Can, you it, can you put it into presenters mode? Is that how that works? I can like present it. Yeah. Yeah. It's in presenting mode. Do you want me to uh, go to the next slide or? Uh, we're seeing it not in presenting mode. So you may have to share a different screen. Okay. We had the same problem yesterday when we did our run through. <laughs> yeah, it's also kind of hard because uh, there you go. Is That's, it yep. better? Okay. Um, okay, I, I guess I'll just uh, announce the title, which is just SRC 2020 with Dr. Newman. Um, we were exploring bacterial metabolism with mud watts, and that should be one word, but it's, um, we'll explain what they are. <laughs> We can also um, leave it like that. Why not? Is it going? Because it's not presenter mode. Again, but I don't think does it matter. Okay. I can see it fine, so it's okay for my end. Interesting. But you guys can still see it? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so um, we, uh, we studied um, bacterial metabolism through mud watts which um, are, they're called, uh, they're microbial fuel cells. And the way they work is you have a species such as Geobacter and Chewinella that when they metabolize certain um, carbon compounds, they pass the end electrons to um, in like an anode or a cathode, right? And um, we do this in our uh, metabolism using O2 as the uh, terminal electron acceptor. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of the main takeaway from in terms of metabolism. Um, but it does open up a lot of uh, applications, not necessarily in sustainable energy, but um, also in studying uh, genetics and so on. Do you guys want to go next? Yeah, I, um, I can start explaining how the mud wall works. OK. I think you have to, do you mind switching the slide though? To, yeah. To three. Is that, do you guys, do you not see it? I think we're seeing a different view than you are. Because uh. we're seeing the, like when you work on it, I think you're probably in a presenting mode. In a different window? Yeah. Maybe stop sharing that one and then look for the other one. You yeah, I'm so sorry. That's okay. Oh, okay. Now you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm uh, yeah. No worries at all. This happens in every 
professional Zoom presentation that I've seen in the last five months. So you're right on board. <laughs> <laughs> so basically the mud watt uses anodes and cathodes to harvest electricity from the bacteria in the mud that we collect um, to ultimately blink an LED light at the top. So um, basically, yeah, the, the um, bacteria produce a current that um, makes electrons and then runs through the system and blinks the LED light um, in an anaerobic environment. And one in an anaerobic environment, um, these bacteria use compounds such as manganese oxide um, as final electron acceptors rather than O2. Um, and in the case of the mud watt, the final electron acceptor is a graphite anode, and it creates a system, and it's actually really cool to see, and you have a blinking light um, from mud in our backyards or in a, in a, uh, a park, um, and it's an accessible system for people to use. All right. Um, okay. We all collected data, and now we're going to go through our results, yeah. Yeah, so um, I used uh, the sample from the same location, which is Brookside Park. Um, and so I made three fuel cells in total. Um, and so my reasoning why I got uh, my sample from the place I got it was because it had like a slightly sulfuric smell. And also the deeper I dug, uh, the darker the mud was. And um, I thought this was a good idea because the ideal uh, inoculum um, for a mud watt is like near like a, a lake or a river, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and that's kind of similar to what that uh, would be. Um, so I sampled my uh, uh, mud from about half an inch underground. Um, and that picture to the right is actually the microscopic picture of my, uh, my sample. Uh, and Tossin, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so I, like I said, I'd made uh, three fuel cells. Uh, the first two uh, I did where it had a soil supplement and a soil amendment, and I also made control. Uh, my control is the blue line on that graph there and my control actually did the best um, and basically it started going after about six days and it peaked at about 185 um, and then it kind of plateaued as you can see and it abruptly kind of dropped after a week and a half um, and so I didn't do anything to manipulate that one. Um, my second one was the water soluble powder which was uh, comprised of uh, nitrogen and phosphate which you mixed into the water and then uh, saturated the mud with it. Um, and I actually figured this would do better because I did some research. Uh, Dr. Newman kind of encouraged us to do that. And um, I found that like nitrogen is a, is a good nutrient for uh, bacteria uh, to use to create the electricity. Um, but this one actually stopped going after about two days. And I also saw like there's a picture there, but there was like a ton of dark spots all around the mud. And so when I met with Mr. Mason, he kind of suggested that uh, I might have like poisoned it. Um, but then my third one, my, my final one, I added soil amendment, which is different through, you add it to the soil directly rather than the water. Um, and this one had uh, bacteria in it and the Latin names were there. Um, and these were gram positive bacteria. And I was kind of skeptical because like Schuonella and Geobacteria, which are like kind of the model uh, microbes, uh, were gram negative bacteria. Um, and also, but this one kind of like surprised me because it started going after two days and um, it, uh, kind of peaked at 135 um, and then dropped kind of gradually, uh, but none of my uh, fuel cells got to the level of my first one. So, yeah. Um, so, no. oh, sorry. Um, this slide's kind of out of order for some reason, but um, so every week we uh, designed and discussed experiments regarding the mud watts. We met scientists over Zoom and read and interpreted both, both primary and secondary literature. Um, there's a picture of Geobacter there, and you can kind of see the pili that they use to connect to the anode um, and pass electrons. So um, that's just an interesting part. Um, next uh, set of data, I guess. Uh, yeah, so I uh, got two different inoculums from different places because I was interested and seeing like how fast it would start with like if are there different levels of bacteria in different places and how well can like we judge where we get our inoculums so I got one from a local park that was like a lighter mud um, 
It was near sitting water and it started after five days of within my fuel cell uh, and got up to like 17 microwatts, which was, or 18 microwatts, which was my all time high. So I definitely had the lowest data of the group, um, but it was kind of interesting because I did get to see the rises and falls of it um, as like day and night and changed throughout the process. Um, and then my second test was from a smell air inoculum that had darker mud. Um, I saturated it around the same level. And uh, what I found interesting about this is it didn't, uh, it also did not get a high wattage, um, but the LED light started blinking after two days, which like signified that the bacterium uh, had an anaerobic population that was greater and more present in the fuel cell sooner. So next slide. Yeah, um, these are just some pictures of trying to look at mud through a microscope and where I got my inoculum, uh, a picture of my two, two fuel cells and my graph of data over time where you can see the like heat changing the wattage that is occurring. Cool. Next slide. Okay. So um, mine is a bit of a tale of uh, failure and then kind of re-entering the, the realm of success um, because I did not get any electricity produced or any results until the second to last week. So my data doesn't really look like it's uh, completed that parabola that you can often see in other groups. So I don't know yet whether or not it's gonna level out or just completely die out. But nevertheless, it provides valuable insights into um, bacterial metabolism and I think also finding an inoculum. Um, at first, I just got garden soil and added water to it. And then the second time I put in rust in one and then plain garden soil in the other. And both of those didn't work. Um, so then upon realizing that maybe I just was not lucky, um, Dr. Newman suggested a site uh, uh, south of Baxter Hall, which is kind of this uh, lily pond um, with a pretty repugnant scent once you start um, messing with the, uh, the sediment within. But um, that was a good sign in this case. And uh, I um, did one just plain, or my control, right, plain. And then the other, um, I added an organic fertilizer that also had um, microbes mixed in, including archaea um, for uh, better nutrient output in the uh, plant or agriculture um, field. So, um, so my control started producing electricity after nine days, and it's been increasing since then with some dips kind of uh, periodically, but mostly it's starting to level out. Um, the control started producing, after, right, um, there you go. And so here are my two mud watts. Um, you can ignore the background, but um, you can see some bubbles that have formed, which is kind of strange because I compressed it. So I'm thinking maybe those are gaseous products. Um, but that still doesn't explain it fully. So I'm a bit curious on why there are bubbles in both cases. It may just be kind of a spongy texture of the sediment. But nevertheless, um, good, uh, it's a good question that I want to answer in the future. Um, and uh, yeah. There you go. So similar to what the other um, people did, I started with an initial experiment um, testing the inoculum and my inoculum had roots. It was light in color. It wasn't particularly muddy when I got it. Um, it was more like a kind of, it was like kind of damp, but it was more like a, like a packed soil. Um, but it did have a bad smell, um, kind of smelling of sulfur. Um, and it was under a tree and I knew that, or I thought that this would be good because the decomposing leaves from the tree um, would serve as a carbon source. So I thought. Um, basically, I combined the mud that was initially not wet um, with fountain water that I had in my backyard. We have this like fountain bowl. It hasn't been running in a while. So it's, it's really like a murky water. It's, it's gross um, to form a thick consistency. Um, and continue to add this fountain water throughout the assembly of the mud watt to saturate the anode and cathode. This one was successful. 
Um, and therefore I had a successful inoculum, which is what I was looking for. Um, and on July 7th, the light started to blink, which was six days after inoculation. This is my graph um, to the right of it. It's actually still blinking more than a month later, which is cool. Um, and it kind of, it's kind of a, um, it drops and goes up. So, but it never went above 40 and still hasn't. It's, it's dropping um, now. And so once I had a successful inoculum, I decided to test a water variable, a hydration um, thing. And because uh, my initial experiment, I used water throughout. Um, I say more water and less water, but, but really both um, mud watts had a lot of water in them. They were both heavily saturated. Um, so for the more water one, I did four and a half cups of dirt um, to one cup of the fountain water. And for the less water, I did four and a half cups of dirt to 0.5 cups of fountain water. Um, and as you can see from the graph to the right, my more water mud watt did significantly better. It did better than my, in, my initial experiment and definitely better than the less water one. The less water one died out about um, after about six days. But the more water one did not start as high as the less water one. Um, the less water one started about 12 microwatts and then quickly died, but the more water one started about three microwatts um, and has since gotten to a max of 173 microwatts. And it's currently still blinking, but is declining rapidly. Um, next slide, please, Austin. So these are, this is a photo on the left of my site. There are leaves around it. Um, as you can see, it's light. It's not super wet. The middle one was to show the consistency of my initial experiment, mud. Um, and then the last one is to show my, my final assembled mud watt for the first one. And this one started blinking. Um, next slide, please, Tostin. And then here's my water variable, all the photos. I have my drier one, uh, my less water one, and then a photo above it of the consistency of the mud. Same thing with the wetter one, um, the consistency of the mud in the bowl, and then the assembled mud watt. You can see that they both have a lot of water in them on the top. Um, and the wetter one, again, did better. The fountain there, it's murky, totally disgusting. Um, and then again, the same spot. Um, I use the same soil for both. So yeah. Um, okay, so this is us combining all of our graphs together, and you can see the variation of our different experiments. And so why they would be so different would be because of the population of the microbes in the soil. Uh, different inoculums could have different anaerobic populations. There could be stronger bacteria in specific soil. There could be a better food source in certain soil, which was also tested by several of us um, as a variable. And so obviously the yellowish line never got very high and that is a symbolic of weak bacteria or bacteria that just was not able to grow in population because of the lack of a food source. Whereas um, the green line was a symbol of like very strong bacteria that was able to uh, reproduce and grow in population until it hit a peak where uh, the food source probably was not um, able to support the level of the population and therefore the bacterium died out. Um, and then the darker blue line symbolizes where the microbes were able to continue growing uh, because of a food source that was not lacking and therefore it continued to grow over time. Um, and overall, I think you can see from these graphs that the variation um, throughout the days where it go, the um, microbes were able to produce more or less wattage um, comes from a variable that we are assuming is heat. While most of us did not like track that the temperature in detail, uh, we noticed that whether you were leaving the fuel cells outside or inside, the heat is changing through by day and night, and the times that we are measuring the wattage uh, varies what the wattage will be. So if we check in the middle of the day where it's hot, there probably will be a higher wattage because these microbes are able to produce, 
produce more energy in a higher heat, um, not too hot. We actually did talk a lot about the optimum temperatures and pH of these microbes. Uh, so it was fun to kind of see that in our graphs as the wattage went up and down and varied with the temperature and with the different variables that we all tested. Um, sorry, I, I don't want to interject, but we uh, it also um, presented an interesting question about whether or not the mud watt is actually a closed system. Um, because some uh, students noticed that, or some of us noticed that the, um, the line would level out or just completely descend, right? So do you have like a suitable bacterial ecosystem where all those waste products are getting processed and then like finally cycling back to electroactive bacteria? Or is it just a set amount and is, does it have a lifespan? Um, right, and then there's light and minimal gas exchange. So um, once again, how do you maintain uh, like a high, um, high power output is a good question. Um, and then bigger applications. So the mud watt isn't necessarily a, a good example of sustainable energy beyond maybe deep sea uh, sensors, but it does give us a valuable tool in studying microbial metabolism and ecology. We often think of the world as being kind of aerobic because we ourselves are aerobic and we're kind of human centric or anthropocentric. But um, a lot of uh, bacteria don't do that. And as a result, we see entire um, chemical compositions being changed. I was amazed when I heard that Lake Oneida had very high oxidate um, reduction rates in uh, metal, um, mainly just due to this one species of bacteria or multiple species. And um, that's very interesting uh, to know like the profound effect that bacteria have on not only the atmosphere and in our water, but also minerals. Um, and that uh, also presents interesting um, applications in terms of eliminating waste products. You hear a lot about bacteria being used to clean up oil spills and so on. Um, I remember Dr. Newman in our first email, our first announcement, she uh, told us that bacteria are some of the best chemists in the world or the best. And it's a question of how we apply that. And uh, that stuck with me uh, as a student. I've remembered that every time we've talked about using bacteria in or applying bacteria, it's fascinating. And I think that's our last slide. Any questions or suggestions? This was kind of um, plagued with technical difficulties, but uh, any ways we can improve this, I'm interested. You guys did a great job. I've been um, in the chat sort of privately writing all of you guys. Um, but what I'll just say right now is I think that one of the things that is this really uh, straightforward next step that could be tried is just to ask the question whether or not in some cases the big drop that you see is simply because th those mud watts were drying out and if water were added if the power could be revived so Chandler has said she's going to try that and Jackie's going to also try that um, and we should report back to each other because it may be that that's a very simple explanation at least for um, some of the uh, dynamics that we saw um, and then I think, you know, Olivia um, did a great job describing other potential um, differences between the samples that you guys had uh, regarding the initial starting conditions of which organisms were there, how many electroactive bacteria were there, what types of, you know, carbon resources they might have had. But a very simple thing that we didn't discuss quite as much that kind of hit me over the head as you guys were laying out your comparative data was simply desiccation <laughs> and the role that, you know, keeping them appropriately wet must obviously play in allowing this whole uh, thing to keep going. All right. So were you guys going to talk about other aspects of the uh, course or was that, that uh, the final slide that you had? We didn't want to take up too much time, but we really enjoyed, uh, I mean, I personally, I can't speak for every student, but I think I am when I say that um, I, I profoundly appreciated meeting all the scientists. Not only is it uh, really fascinating to learn about their expertise and what they do for a living, but also their career plans and what they do with bacteria, all of them did something different. Um, and that's valuable. Uh, 
as a high schooler. And what I found was really cool about all these people is that they all had like some sort of goal that would greatly impact the world in a way that we may not have um, like seen as like normal people, but their ultimate goal would really change what was happening in the scientific community. So just meeting the people that would change and maybe rewrite textbooks some days, that was fascinating too. So thank you. Very nice guys. Um, I think you were perfectly on time, right? I think we were aiming to have your presentation be about a half an hour and now we're at almost the halfway mark. So good job in organizing all of that. And uh, I am very pleased with how well things went. And as you know, I really enjoyed our weekly sessions very much. And I hope to hear from all of you guys going forward. Um, but maybe now we should pass the baton over to the other group and hear what they did, unless the other group or anyone else has more questions for you guys. Well, I would like to ask one, and that's just, I'll ask a couple of the students just uh, at random here, but um, Chandler, I'll ask you first. So uh, what was the most important thing you learned in this about uh, scientific experimentation? I think that, um, I think that, I guess, in the terms of like, bringing in Dr. Newman and uh, the scientists, seeing like how uh, the things you can do within the, uh, within the field, like I'd like one of the people she brought in, he did like this like deep sea diving, looking for applying what we're learning with the microbes, like down at the bottom of the ocean, something I never thought, you know, it happened it kind of expanded like my horizons of like what I want to do in the future and so I, I think what I took away greatly from this is just like you're not like when I think of chemistry or biology or physics like I, I, I kind of like limit like myself when I think about it but it kind of expanded like it all coincides everything this kind of brought aspects of, of all the fields and I thought that was really cool it, it was really awesome okay great and can I ask a similar question of Olivia uh, yeah, I also really loved the variation in the field, uh, how we learned about like bench work and field work and how the Mars rover will be like looking for microbes just like we are looking, looking at microbes in the soil and how these microbes are able to produce energy that might not be able to fuel a car but can fuel a battery for lab equipment at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, things like that were just like really cool to learn and made me really interested in this whole field of study and like it's it was really cool to see the variation and then how like early this field is and how much can change by the time that we actually like get to create our own experiments so that was really cool okay great thanks and i would like to ask my students if they would like to ask some uh, some questions of the other students um yeah i was just wondering for all of you like how did you decide where to get your like bacteria samples or your like microbe samples? Like, were you looking for like things that like had that like repugnant smell or like what really drive those choices? Uh, right. You're, you're really looking for an anaerobic environment, um, which seems hard. But one thing that we were also talking about in our final meeting was that you have to think of things at the micro scale. So the reason why the mudwatt works from an uh, economical standpoint or commercial standpoint is that once you get a certain very short distance below the soil, you have an anaerobic environment that you can get these bacteria from and they're fairly cosmopolitan. Um, we don't have a lot of lakes in Southern California. So it was kind of hard finding more, uh, not more, more better isn't a grammatically, grammatically accurate term but um, finding better inoculum. So the Baxter Pond, for example, that I sourced mine from, that was really the best I think that I could find because uh, there was you know, smells and so on that kind of symbolized that there was a lot of back activity going on. And also like what Tossin was saying, I believe that we all like wiped away the top level of the soil to get to the anaerobic bacteria. Um, 
And then also I added the, the fountain water because it that it, it was just disgusting. Like it smelled bad. Um, so that was my way of kind of replicating the like a pond environment of um, the papers we read. Um, and everyone had their own way of doing it too. And trying to find something smelly was definitely um, a factor. So we didn't have access to you know, isolated strains of these bacteria. So it was kind of almost gambling of just choosing a spot, making an educated guess, and then exposing it to an anaerobic environment and just hoping that that bacteria ends up at the top. So, yeah. Okay, great. Did uh, Justin or Charlie have any questions? No, I'm good. Okay, all right. <laughs> no. Okay, if not, uh, should we go over to our presentation then? Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, let me do a screen share here. So ours is gonna be set up a little differently because I'm gonna talk um, first and it looks like that didn't work. Hold on. Try this again. Okay, I'm, I'm just seeing the Zoom window. Are you guys actually, see, here we go. So you're seeing the first slide, okay? Okay, all right, so um, I'll go first and I'll talk for uh, the first few minutes and I'll hand off to each of the students individually. Uh, but our project this summer was called The Quest for Cold Brown Dwarfs. And I'm Davey Kirkpatrick. I'm a, a lead research astronomer at IPAC on the Caltech campus. And the students who are working with me this summer were Kareem Amar from Polytechnic, uh, Charlie Elachi from St. Francis, and Justin Hong from Pasadena High. Okay. So the question we were investigating this summer was, what is the lowest mass object that can create, be created as a product of the star formation process? And by the star formation process, we're talking about a cloud of gas that collapses under its own gravity and forms stars like the sun. And we know that objects fairly low in mass can be created by this process. And the ones that are lowest in mass are called brown dwarfs. And those are ones that are below about 70 times the mass of Jupiter. And they're kind of special in that uh, when they collapse, their interiors don't heat up enough that they can actually ignite thermonuclear fusion in their cores. So unlike a star like the sun that can shine at a constant rate for billions of years, these things don't have that energy source. So they continue to cool and cool forever. And um, there's a very hard to pick up as a result of that because they are uh, so cool and with time they get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So they're very hard to locate. And they come in four different flavors, which we'll talk about briefly here. There's the M dwarfs, L dwarfs, T dwarfs, and Y dwarfs. And the ones that are on the cool end are the T dwarfs and the Y dwarfs. And those are the ones that we were looking for during this project. And I'll say also that we know that uh, brown dwarfs can form down to at least five Jupiter masses, but we think they can form at even smaller masses than that. So what our project was poking at this summer was to see if we could actually find examples that could be pressing this low mass limit even further down. And I'd like to mention here also that uh, these objects are a lot like free-floating planets, but they don't form the way planets normally do because planets generally form out of the leftover material around the star that's already formed, and there will be a protoplanetary disk that forms around the star, and then the, the objects actually coalesce out of that disk as a result of that process. And that's how we think the planets in our own solar system form. But this is another avenue that uh, planets can actually form by, except they're not exactly the kinds of planets we normally think about. Okay, so here's a, the more technical part of the talk, and this is just showing the spectra. So this is the admitted light from each one of these objects, a mid-M dwarf, a mid-L dwarf, a mid-T dwarf, and a, an early Y dwarf. And we're looking at these over the spectrum from about uh, 0.6 microns, which is also known as 6,000 angstroms, which is about the longest wavelength of light that your eye can see. That's on the left-hand side of the graph. And on the far right-hand side of the graph is uh, 15 microns. So this is pushing all the way out into the mid-infrared. And the data set we're gonna to use to be looking for these objects is, uh, is the WISE data set from the WISE, NASA's mission called WISE. And uh, the reason we're using that particular data set is it has data within this region where the, the coldest brown dwarfs are actually at their brightest. And we're showing that here by the, the two bands labeled as W1 and W2. So you can think of this as the satellite itself having two different cameras. 
and each camera has a different filter in front of it. And one of those filters is W1. And if you look at the W1 filter, you see that uh, the main thing it's looking at is this very strong methane band, which you see particularly in the, the T dwarfs and the Y dwarfs. And that methane band is in the atmosphere and it's absorbing a lot of the light that's trying to leak out from the object, except those atoms, those molecules rather, are absorbing that light back. So it turns out that the, the, the T dwarfs and the Y dwarfs are actually kind of dark in that particular filter because light can't leak out as easily. But if you go to the W2 band, which is between four and five microns, you see that there's a lot of light leaking out there because there aren't any absorbers in the way to speak of. There's no overlying methane absorption or water absorption or ammonia absorption. So if we look at uh, images that are taken that combine the W1 band and the W2 band, you'll see uh, that they end up being in, in certain color stretches, which I'll show you in a minute, end up looking orange because most of the light is coming out of the longer wavelength. So here's an example of two images taken from the Y spacecraft and I'll just notice or note that um, we tend to, in astronomy to look at black stars on a white background, although with your eye you normally see light colored stars on a black background, but we just do this, we invert the color scale because it's easier to see small details. So in this image, and I'll just show the one in 2018, we've got a field of stars here and there's one object that's kind of unusual compared to all the rest and that's this guy. And he's very orange. And the reason he's orange in this color stretch is that we're seeing almost no light come through the W1 filter. And all the light we see for this object is coming out in the W2 filter. So this is exactly the kind of brown dwarf we're looking for. So the first thing we're gonna do, and I, I gave each one of the students a different method to use. And the first method we're gonna talk about is the color search. So that's strictly looking for objects that are orange. Well, there's a second uh, method we can use too, and that's called motion. And the Y spacecraft uh, was taking data uh, through all of 2010 and the, the very last part of 2009, because that's when the spacecraft launched. Uh, but NASA finally shut it off in early 2011 and said they were out of money and that we couldn't operate anymore. So we put the satellite into hibernation for three years and we finally convinced NASA to turn it back on again. So they turned it back on in late 2013, I think it was, and we've been taking data ever since. So we have this very long time baseline that we can look at these images because keep scanning the sky over and over and over again. And uh, what we're able to do now is look for these cold objects because we can only see them so far out, not very far from the sun at all. That means all the ones that we're able to detect are fairly close. So we can actually see them moving relative to all the more distant stars in the background. So one thing we'll try here is just looking for motion, orange things that are moving, for example. And then the last thing I'll mention is there's a third technique we can use, which is parallax. And that is uh, the Y spacecraft is actually uh, in orbit around the Earth. But of course, the Earth is in orbit around the sun itself. So as the Earth goes around the sun, the vantage point of the spacecraft is actually changing within the Milky Way itself by a very small amount. But you can use triangulation to actually figure out whether a star is close or not, because as the, the thing is actually moving across the sky, you'll see it wiggle slightly, wiggle, 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 wiggle. And those wiggles are just an imprint of our sun's motion around the earth onto that object. And the bigger the wiggle, the closer the object is because the triangulation effect is even bigger. Um, so I'll finally say here that the, the wise images themselves were processed with a, a piece of pipeline code, code called CatWise. And what that does is it goes in and characterizes every detected source. And all of those characterizations are put into this giant database. And the giant database is put into the Infrared Science Archive at IPAC. And then I went in and queried that database for certain um, characteristics like color, motion, parallax, and created a giant list of uh, candidates. And the candidate list for each one of these projects were 100,000 plus. So it was a bunch of stuff to look through. And we knew this was way more than we could look through in just six weeks. So we applied a machine learning algorithm to those candidates to have the best ones bubbled up to the top. So the students went to the best stuff right away. And those are the ones we did for, or used for by eye follow-up. And what we used for the by eye follow-up was a, a tool that was actually invented by one of our citizen scientists who works on this project separately. He's unfunded, but he just loves doing this stuff. He's actually a computer expert in his own right. But he created this wise view tool that allows us to look at the candidates in, in very fine detail. And the first thing it does is you can put any position on the sky and pull up the wise images for that position. Uh, you can make a movie of all the images over the entire time baseline of the data. 
or you can just blink between the earliest and the latest to see if objects are actually bouncing back and forth uh, due to their motion. You can change the speed of the movie, the size of the image that's being shown, or the stretch if you want to look for things that are very faint in the background. And then at the bottom here, you see there's a, an image from a different survey, and this is an optical survey called PanStars. And you can actually look to see if your object is visible at the shorter wavelengths, because brown dwarfs really should be very dark, very, very faint at these optical wavelengths, it shouldn't show up at all. So that's an additional check you can do. So I will now hand off to the first uh, technique, which was a color search that Kareem did. Okay, hello, my name is Kareem Amar, and so, as Davy said, I did the color search. So as you can see here, I put three images. And so you see the W1 plus W2, and there's this really strong orange, like brown dwarf. And you can see that since all the lights coming through W2. So I then put W1 and then also W2 next to it. So as you can see, W1, the, the orange object is basically invisible, invisible, and you really can't see anything. But as you look at W2, there's a very strong black dot signifying that really all the lights coming through that W2 band and causing this orange color when they're put together. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. So procedure. So as Davey said, I was looking for the, the orange color search. So really the first step is really looking for that orange color. And after that step, I mean, occasionally I had to play with like pixel values just because the, the orange color may be super faint. So having to, increase those pixel values in order to see it more clearly was necessary to really see if it was orange or not. And then that next step would be looking for movement of the object because since these objects are so faint, we can only see objects that are closer to us. So of course, they're gonna have that movement on the background of all the other stars. So that was another step in seeing if these brown doors were actually good candidates. And then finally, I would plug in the coordinates to Sinbad. Sinbad's a database where you could see if that brown dwarf has been found or not. And after that, if it hasn't been put into Sinbad, I would send it to Davey yet again for him to look at it and see if it was in other databases. Next slide, please. So new discoveries. So after looking around 2,000 images, I managed to discover around seven new brown dwarf candidates that haven't been found in any other data set. And we'll be looking at four. So the first one, why is 1328? Uh, we use this uh, graph from Davy's paper that really shows the W1 mi minus W2 magnitude will help you find out what spectral type the, the brown dwarfs are. And for this one, why is 1328? It had a spectral type of T7 because, yeah, because of its magnitude. And then again, for Y1541, it was a spectrotype colder than T8.5 because the, the magnitude wasn't really trustworthy at that position. So we only know that it is colder than T8.5. T and then again, for Y1324, the spectrotype of T7. And then Y1329, it was at a T8.5. Yet again, we didn't have the reliable magnitude at that position. So just by looking at that W1 minus W2 magnitude, one can determine the spectrotype of their brown dwarf candidate. So we're gonna be looking at the first one here. Uh, these are all new discoveries by me. So why is 1328? As you can see here, you have that really strong orange color. And this was also more interesting because there isn't any other orange things in the background and there isn't really a lot going on. So really seeing that orange color really tells you that there's definitely something there of interest. And there isn't much movement, so I was a little skeptical, but after looking at it, we determined that, hey, this could really be a, an interesting location. And then looking at why is 1541, yeah, 1541, there's a, as you can see, there's a faint, faint orange in the center there. And I had to play with the pixel values in order to see that better, but you can see this little skip at the end of it showing that there, there is that movement. So that was really interesting to me because as Davey said, these brown dwarfs are super faint and you have to play with these pixel values in order to see their, their color. So yeah, next slide, please. So again, uh, Y is 2324. As you can see, again, there's that orange color, really strong orange color with not a lot going on in the background. And that really just told me that, again, this is a good brown dwarf candidate because of that strong W2 band. But again, there isn't much movement. So we went through that same process and this one was also a pretty good candidate. And looking at the one on the right, Again, we see this super faint orange color, 
but there is an, also an awkward movement where it seems to be crawling up to the, to the right corner and then jump to the left corner. So then again, it was very interesting to see this movement in a brown dwarf candidate. And so it was one of the, one of the better candidates I had too. So challenges. So after looking around 2000 images, like a, like a small percentage of them were actually like pretty good candidates that you could look at. And especially as you got into like the after 1000 candidates, things started to get a little busy. So the algorithm would choose these things called the fraction spikes where these long, long, long spikes like coming from large stars that really had this orange color and would jump up and down. So the algorithm was like, oh, it's something that's orange and moving. Therefore, let me plug it into the data set. But in actuality, those aren't really anything. And it really just cluttered the, the data set. And then also you'd have these massive stars that would take up the entire screen and have this strong orange blinking color in the, in the center. Again, confusing the algorithm and then proving to be like another thing you have to sift through. Then you also had just these screens of like intense and busy star formations. And this again was just another obstacle that you had if you wanted to like look for all these candidates. So yeah, that was really it. So I'm Charlie, my name is Charlie Lachi, and I did the parallax method. So the parallax method is basically what Davey said, is an object that reflect the Earth's orbit around the sun. And these objects are usually close to us, and they're majorly moving because that's how we catch them. The algorithm catches an object that's close to us, and that is moving. So next slide. So... I went through about 3,000, I had 3,000 candidates to go through and I went to, through about 2,032. And I only found a few new candidates and everything else was discovered. So we're gonna be looking at five candidates that I found, but all of them are discovered except one of them. But the fifth one is a brand new, we might think it's a brown dwarf, but we speculate that's a variable, two variable stars. So the five, those are the five uh, candidate names, but those are not the actual coordinates. And about the parallax, parallax method, all the, Davey told me that this is not the hardest method to look for brown dwarf, but it's the most interesting because if you find something, it's going to be very unique and most likely no one has found out about it. But it's very hard to find something because it's so busy and there's so many fraction spikes and stars forming and the alg algorithm catches so many different like particles and all that kind of stuff. Uh, next slide. So these two candidates, they're discovered already before me. So 1828, um, as you can see, it's it's one orange brown dwarf. It's moving, it's clearly moving. You can tell, oh, that's a brown dwarf. And 1841 is has a slight little jump, and it's not as bright as the one on the left, but you can also tell it's a brown dwarf. There's no other orange objects around it. Next slide. So then it gets a little bit busier here. So 1741 on the left, it's a little bit darker and it's moving. So that's obviously a brown dwarf. But on the right, 1928, it's a lot more busier. There's a few stars around, which explains the black spots. And it's a little bit hard to decide if it was a brown dwarf or not, but it was already discovered. It's not moving so much, but it might have a co-mover in it because it, it kind of tracks something with it. So next slide. This is a new discovery I made, but we're not sure if the brown dwarf for two variables to ours. So 2108 is basically our orange smudge that stretches as it moves and it's fading and like the left side is fading and the right side is becoming brighter. So a variable star is a star that very uh, changes in brightness. So over the time or over the years, the left side may be dimming and the right side may be getting brighter, which gives the illusion of something moving, which may not be a brown dwarf, but we're still not sure yet. Right, next slide. So some of the challenges I had, they're very similar to Kareem's, but also I had, uh, for example, on the left image, there are two orange objects or maybe three, and they're not any brown dwarfs, they're just stars forming or variable stars, and some images would just be all clustered with all these orange dots. And on the left, it would just be very busy and like all these black stars forming. 
and there's a lot of forming stars and there's a lot of dust everywhere and the algorithm catches it and it just says, oh, this might be a brown dwarf, but really it's just a bunch of stars forming. Next slide. So the distance of each brown dwarf. So but if you told me that wise is a good, it does some good estimation, but it's not a distance when it estimates it is not as well as the brand new Spitzer. So wise estimated my first candidate would be 0 0.3 by negative 0 0.1, but Spitzer distance was actually 10.0 uh, and 0 0.2 uh, parsecs. And my second candidate, I'm going by Spitzer from now, Spitzer's distance was 28.5 by negative 2.6 parsecs. My third was uh, 4.7 parsecs by negative 0 0.1 parsecs. My fourth was 6.5 by negative 1 parsecs. And the newest one I have was found in Catwise, but not in Spitzer. So it was, its estimated distance was, might not be correct right now, but it's 3.4 by, by negative, point, uh, negative 0 0.14 parsecs. And that's it. Okay, so uh, my search was the motion search, and as the name suggests, you base the potential brown dwarf on its movement. And you can see in the example below that the uh, brown dwarf is moving a lot over the eight years period, and it's exhibiting a very bright orange color, which uh, tells us that it is most likely a brown dwarf. Next slide, please. Um, so I think I have four discoveries or rediscoveries on here. So the first one is Wise 1023. And um, most of the discoveries I found were pretty similar because they were all both based on motion and some color. So the first one that we see on the left here, uh, it's exhibiting pretty obvious movement and it looks pretty orange. And I was quite surprised when I found out that it was relatively new. And for the one on the right, Y's 1827. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Davey told me that this was actually a rediscovery. You can see that it's really faint, but if you change the, uh, the pixel values and uh, you can very obviously see that it is moving. Uh, next slide, please. So for Y's 2256, the one on the left here, um, it's moving a lot less than the previous ones that we saw. But if you do skip middle epics, basically look at its position the first year and the last year, you can see that it's bouncing back and forth between two positions. And for Y's 2309 on the right, it again, it's bouncing back and forth between two positions and it has a pretty orange color. So um, why is 1827, uh, the rediscovery I found was initially marked as having a W1 minus two, minus W2 magnitude of uh, 1.05 plus or minus 0 0.04. But um, upon closer examination, it, it was found that um, that's actually not the magnitude of its W1 minus W2. And it's actually a lot more orange than that. So the current estimation is that it is probably a T9.5 dwarf, almost a Y dwarf. And the challenges is that it's sometimes hard to tell if, it, if a moving object is a brown dwarf or not, because uh, more often than not, I would get a high proper motion star, which is a star that is not a brown dwarf, that is moving around a lot. And so I had to take color into consideration as well. So I think I definitely missed a few brown dwarfs here and there that were really dark and did not look like brown dwarfs on the first look. And like uh, Kareem and Charlie, I got a lot of diffraction spikes, but um, I found a lot of cool things such as Herbic Hero objects, the image on the left. They're basically like giant space clouds that shoot out little ejections that look like brown dwarfs. So as you can see in the very center of the image on the left, I, we initially thought that was a brown dwarf, 
because it was moving and it was pretty orange, but it was actually part of the ejection from the Herbic Hero to the right. And so that was a pretty cool discovery. And I think that's it. That's it. Okay, we can take some questions. I just wrote something in the chat to everyone that unifies our projects, uh -huh. <laughs> provides a, a linkage numerically, which is kind of amazing. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> just to put it into context. <laughs> um, so uh, those are big numbers, whether we're talking about the stars in the universe, uh, and clearly you guys had to sort through quite a lot of data, and, and that is even after I, as I understood your presentation, there had been a machine learning algorithm that had kind of whittled it down, but you still had to go through it and you still found all these interesting caveats. And so fortunately humans are still important in this process. Um, and so I was wondering for you students, um, what aspect of this um, did you find most interesting or surprising? Like. Uh, and and the second question would be if you were to continue with your project uh what do you think would be a very um valuable next step like if you could wave a magic wand and improve these algorithms somehow you know what would you focus on doing so i'll ask kareem to answer first and then um justin and then charles i mean at first like I mean, I live in Pasadena and like, you know how in LA the sky is like mostly black because of the light pollution. So just like actually seeing like how much is out there is just was just incredible, like upon first glance. But like after looking and sorting through, it's just like, it was, it was like really a good skill to be able to sort through all these images. And then like by the end of it, I got to go super quickly and plug in all, like try all these different things and all these different methods I picked up. And then also once a week we'd meet with these other scientists back on the East Coast. And it was just really intriguing seeing like all of these scientists like have all these like, like it was just really interesting seeing like how advanced they were in looking at all these brown dwarfs and they'd even get the spectral type just by even like looking at it. They didn't even have to look at the graph. And it was just really intriguing just to see like how advanced they were. And for like, if I could continue this project, I think like personally, I'd want to go down the parallax route just to try to see like, what what we could do to try to find more of those maybe put more more things into the machine learning process in order to in order to find those ones and then also i know we were talking about how in those really busy parts of the sky there's a lot of brown dwarfs that we can't even see because of the because other objects are putting their all their light in so i think that also might be an, another step that i could that we could use mm -hmm. yeah. Just All right, so I guess it's my turn. Um, so I think the most interesting part of this project for me, also the most fun part, was actually finding things that weren't brown dwarfs, like the Herbic Harrow object. And also, I think I found a nebula somewhere. I just couldn't find the coordinates. Um, so yeah, that was pretty fun. It was also pretty fun finding things that um, barely any people or no people at all have found before. like. Um, some I found some really faint brown dwarfs that looked like they weren't brown dwarfs at all, but knowing that I might be the first person to have ever discovered that was pretty fun. And um, awesome. if I were to do this again or keep on going, I would definitely, like Kareem, try to go the parallax route because um, I just want to see what, because not searching through using parallax it was kind of hard to understand what parallax actually was. So I actually want to experience what the parallax search is actually like. Um, so I come from a family that's really into science and like space. So I was really intrigued by it. And it was just looking at pictures from space. Like, I don't know how, how much better I could get. Like not many people could say they did that, especially in like, a high schooler and it was really fun just looking at new pictures and like discovering new things and learning that things i didn't know about like i knew a little bit about brown dwarf but now I, brown dwarfs 
but now I know a lot more about it. And I'd still stick to the parallax method because it's like, I think it's the most challenging one, not because it's like hard in any way, like you don't have to be skillful to do it, but it's just a lot of things you have to concentrate on. And I'm into computers, so maybe I could, like I want to just learn how to like, maybe make the algorithm a little bit better to catch more brown dwarfs or more specific things other than diffraction spikes or debris and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I think it is an amazing thing about science is that you can see things for the first time that other people haven't and you can figure out ways of improving the methods so that you can see. Um, and certainly there is a real need also for people who do computer science in biology because not only do we have a lot more bacteria than stars, <laughs> those bacteria all have a lot of genes. And uh, these days it's really inexpensive to sequence them. And we have more data than we know how to analyze. Um, and part of the limit is computer science, but also part of the limit is just basic understanding of what those gene functions are. So there's a lot to discover. Um, and if you can't see from Pasadena the the night sky very well, um, I encourage you to just go to the soil because you can find, I just put another factoid that I love, there are a billion bacteria in a teaspoon of soil <laughs> outside your door. Um, that's a lot. And so totally different order of magnitude. Um, the scale is completely different, but you can see quite a lot uh, locally, <laughs> just at a very different scale. I have a question, just sort of a, a random thing. Do you get to name your discoveries? Uh, or does it go in a log somewhere that you discovered this brown dwarf on this date with this? Is um, there anything like that? Well, let me answer that one. So they've been re referring to the objects by, you know, Wise 1828 and things like that. So they are generally named for the spacecraft and the location on the sky where they're found. But I will note that uh, I'm currently writing a paper on this very topic, and I've added all three of the high school students as co-authors because they have rediscovered some of the objects that are new discoveries in that paper, um, in addition to actually finding some brand new ones that, for the most part, aren't going in this particular paper, except for the object that uh, Justin brought up, which was the rediscovery. That was Wise 1827, I think, that... Uh, a bunch of astronomers had found that one previously and completely misclassified it. So the fact that he pulled it out again made us look at it one more time and we're like, whoa, <laughs> this is actually a close, very late T dwarf that we completely overlooked. Nice. Well, that's something certainly worthy of your college uh, uh, essays <laughs> next year. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and by the way, I'm in a uh, paper uh, that uh, published by Caltech. Are there any questions from the Mudwat students for this other group? Do you think um, combining your methods would uh, yield better results too? Yeah, I think like each of us kind of were looking for the same thing, like except for Charlie, of course, because he was looking for that like wiggle. But for like me and me and Justin a lot, we were looking for that color and movement like thing. So like. I know Justin was looking at movement like specifically, but we noticed that like things that even like weren't moving at all, but had that color were pretty important. And also I know Justin for like some of his discoveries, they're like, like black, like they didn't have that color. So it was like, like it just, they're kind of on two different like sides of the spectrum. Like I was kind of looking for color, he was looking for movement. And I think like having a union of the two would find those like really good brown dwarfs. But yeah. I don't know about parallax though, it was like pretty out there. How long would you say that it took you to look through the 3,000 things, the 3,000 photos? Um, it depends on the method because for me, there's so much like junk in the pictures. So it might take me like 10 minutes to go through like 100 photos because I already knew all oh, there's nothing there. I just have to adjust the value. But I don't know about Justin and Kareem because maybe there's a lot of like different moving objects, so it might take them a while to go through like ten photos. Um, I'd say after the five hundred point, you could just go through them pretty quick because there's quite a lot of junk, like diffraction spikes or 
those messes that Kareem showed. So you can just, sometimes I just go through 16 or 32 of these candidates without finding a single Brandorf candidate. So you could go through them pretty quickly. And let me add one thing here, and that is the, the WISE catalog itself has almost 2 billion source detections in it, and we know of 40 wide dwarfs. So there's uh, a whole lot of haystack and very few needles. Were you guys using like a program or was it like a file and photos that you just went through? So it was like an HTML file that, that Davey sent to us. And then it had the, it just had like a catalog. So it had like 1632. And then you just press it and it would open 16 tabs with that screen. And you just would just look through all of it. And you had that thing on the side that you could play with the pixels and, and the duplicate windows and stuff like that. But yeah, it's like you, each time you like finish 16, you go to the next one, it like pops up 16 for you. And so you just keep going through that process. Yeah. That's what I have. Okay, any other questions? Which telescopes collected this data? Was it multiple telescopes or how did, how did you build the database that you were pulling from? So these were all from the WISE spacecraft. So just the, the two band data from it. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? I'd just like to thank you all, uh, uh, Will, Diane, and Davey, for leading this charge, and certainly for all the students. Uh, SRC was very different this year than it has been in the past, uh, and we were grateful that everyone was willing to uh, see how we could make this experience work remotely, and you all did an amazing job. And uh, I, I'm, I'm so happy and grateful for all the work you all put in. I'm very proud of all of you, the whole team, both teams, and then coming together for this presentation. This was. This is a real treat for me just to get to sit in and observe what you've been working on. So thank you. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> Thanks for uh, organizing it and making it all possible and your generosity in uh, you know, getting the equipment that we needed uh, for the students. That was really, really nice. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, any other parting words? This yeah, time. have a good year, you guys. Keep doing science and being creative. You've learned you can do it even if you're not in person. <laughs> so go for it. Keep exploring your mud watts. Don't let them wither and die. <laughs> Keep exploring your data sets. Yeah. Good, good luck to everybody. Science is awesome. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations.